First, when you're analyzing A-B test results, you want to make sure that you've hit the sample size that is required to run the test. And you should pre-calculate that sample size and decide how long you're going to run the A-B test for. Am I going to run the A-B test until I hit 150,000 visitors? Am I going to wait until 300,000 visitors? But that should be predetermined. Now we have data. Let's look at the data and let's determine what do we do. So what we do is usually take a look at each one of the variations that is in the test. So let's assume that this test has multiple variations. We look at the performance of each of our variations. There are instances where you have a variation that is a clear loser, correct? You ran it, decreased conversion rates by 10%, has no chance of beating the original. That's a clear cut. Okay, we're done. This V1 is a clear loser in the test, so we're excluding it, we don't really need to spend time. Now we can do further analysis to understand what was the hypothesis, why did it lose, and what do we learn from that? Then we jump into the variations that, let's say we look at a couple of other variations and they both had an increase in conversions. Great. It's not enough to look at the increase in conversions. You want to look at just have a high probability or chance to be best or to be the original. Usually you declare a winner when you're at 85 or 90 percent chance to beat an original in Bayesian statistics at 95% confidence and frequentist. And by the way, whether 80 or 85 or 90 or 95, these are artificial numbers that people have put together. There's nothing magical about 95 versus 92 versus 90 versus 97. Now I'm analyzing the performance of those variations. I'm saying, okay, well, this one did really well. It has a high chance to be the original. So that is a potential winner for the test. Not necessarily the winner. We want to drill a bit deeper. If it has a high confidence, if it has a high chance to beat, you might say, you know what? This is very clear an uplifts and conversions 10 percent a 97 percent chance to be best or to be the original that's it that's my winner i'm done now i'm going to drill a bit deeper into the hypothesis and the design behind this variation to see what did we do there why did people react positively to it another metric that i like to look at even for those winning variations is the revenue impact of a variation so you can look at the average or value you can look at the revenue per visit or revenue per visitor those are three different metrics but those give you an indication for that particular variation, how it performed compared to the original. The original generates an RPV, a revenue per visit of, let's say, $3. This variation might generate also an RPV of $3.30. So not only did we increase conversions, but we also increased the RPV. That's an easy, clear-cut decision. Things get a little harder when, oh, it gave you a 10% lift in conversions, but it caused a 10% drop in RPV or 5% or 15% in RPV. So that you want to pay close attention to. Sometimes people struggle because when they they see a drop in RPV, they're like, oh, well, maybe we don't have a winner. No, your analysis when it comes to an A-B test is mainly driven by conversion rates because conversion rate is a binary event. Somebody came to the site, they bought or did not buy. Your analysis secondary metric is the revenue metric. It's not a main metric. It's a nice guidance. I don't make decisions based on the revenue. Making decisions based on revenue requires complex statistical analysis that most A-B testing, actually, I dare say maybe all A-B testing don't have. So you don't rely on that. You want to keep an eye on it though. The only time I look very closely at the revenue metric, if I see like a 25% difference between one variation to the next. But even with that, control has an RPV of $3 and a variation has an RPV of $2. Huge difference. Like, hey, what's going on? Did we actually cause a 30% drop in conversions? Not necessarily. What you need is you need to make sure, look at the revenue order, the revenue that was generated by the variation, because imagine that this variation might have a couple of orders with very small amounts. Maybe 10 people place an order with $5 and the control had 50 people who placed orders with $200, correct? So you have these numbers that change tremendously because of extreme orders on both sides, low and high, can cause this variation. So you want to look at this very carefully. That's the second set of variations. Third set of variation is a variation that it lost in conversions. But again, I see an increase in revenue. Does the increase in revenue justify looking closely at this variation? This analysis is just purely done based on the number. There's another side that needs to be combined with the numbers, which is looking at the designs and looking at the direction that we're going into as a business. Sometimes one of your variations represent the direction that the business is going to, or it represents a vision that you want to go to. We're making changes right now on our product page because we envision that in the next couple months, there will be more changes and they're all built on top of this. That's a business decision, not an optimization decision, but it's important to evaluate also the variations and look at those numbers. Sometimes one of your variations, you're like, you know what, it's so close to the original 
original. It doesn't matter to me whether it lost or it won. There's not a huge change. So one of the variations I was looking at in the test that we were evaluating earlier, I could not even tell the difference. And sometimes we introduce those for many reasons because we want to calibrate the tool. That's a whole other discussion. But sometimes we introduce some of those variations into a test. So what do we do after all of this? Sometimes you have a clear winner, you're done. Sometimes it's not necessarily a clear winner. You have a couple of variations that won in terms of increasing conversions, but not high probability of success. You have one variation that decreased conversions, but really nice increase in revenue per visit. What we do most of the time is we launch a second iteration of the test. We say, you know what? We're going to go for a second iteration. We're going to exclude the losing variations. We're going to exclude the variation that doesn't look a whole lot different than the control, reducing the number of variations. But now we're going to be running the test again. There is science to the post-test analysis, but there's also an art to it. Really sit back, think about the hypothesis, the statistics, and say, okay, here's the decision that I'm going to make. And it is fun to uncover problems. It is fun to come up with A-B testing ideas. It is fun to watch the A-B test results. But I mean, to me, the slicing and the dicing of the data afterwards is even more fun. Let me add just one other thing as a whole new level of complexity, another dimension, which is let's take each one of those variations and let's segment it based on traffic source. Are we seeing different traffic sources with different conversion rates? By the way, that adds a whole other level of complexity because, oh, well, this variation won for paid traffic, but this variation won for organic traffic. That's a whole other interesting discussion that you'll have to go through, but you should slice and dice the data to have a better idea of what you are dealing with.